welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. It's getting about time to spray some soybeans. And when we do, you know what, Darren? Roundup may not work for every weed we've got out there anymore. We're going to talk today about soybean tank mix partners for Roundup. We'll also be talking about a management practice that many farmers across the country are adopting. It's called plant tissue testing. By taking leaf samples from those plants, the plants will actually tell you what nutrients they need in order to maximize your yields. Seems to make a lot of sense to me, Brian. It does. So does controlling our Weed of the Week. We've got that coming up later in the show. But first, here's this week's Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. During our Farm Basics time today, we want to talk a little about economic thresholds for insects. Now, don't get me wrong here, we're not going to get super complicated. If you're a non-farmer, we want you to understand what this is, basically so you know that farmers just don't go randomly spraying pesticides out there. They're looking at how many bugs they actually have in the field first before they spray. Well, that's not the case for me, Brian. Around my house, if I've got one mosquito flying around in the yard and I want to spend that night that's in, your economic out in the yard, threshold, though. one is all it takes because it can <laughs> completely ruin my night. You know, when we're out in fields, if you have one bug in a whole field and you have 30,000 corn plants or 150,000 soybean plants, I'm not too worried about the damage one bug is going to do. But it's amazing to me when you look at certain insects out in fields, how just a few bugs can really ruin a crop for a farmer. And when the treatment options are relatively inexpensive, it doesn't take many bugs to justify spraying a field. So what this comes back to is how many bugs does it take to do a certain amount of yield damage? So for example, let's say in an acre, it takes 10,000 bugs to cause one bushel yield loss and 20,000 bugs to cause two bushel yield loss for soybeans. If the soybeans are worth let's say $10 a bushel, just for easy figuring, and the cost of the treatment was $10, then obviously if you're gonna spend 10 to gain $10, that really doesn't make any sense. That's not what we're looking for. What we are looking for though is if I can gain $15, let's say for example, at $10 cost, that's pretty good. So basically my economic threshold is that $10, and if that happens to be, whatever, 10,000 bugs out there, then that's what I'm going for. Well, farmers aren't gonna count how many bugs are in no, the entire acre. but what they're gonna, they're gonna do is they're around. gonna, they might count one one hundredth or one one thousandth of an acre, something like that. Exactly. And there are ways to figure it out down to the plant. And so what farmers will do is they'll either count the number of bugs per plant or they'll take a sweep net and as they walk through the crop, they can just make a few sweeps and after 10 sweeps or 20 sweeps, they can look what's in that net count how many insects are in there, look for problem bugs, and figure out if they have enough bugs to justify treatment. The other thing that farmers will look for in that sweep net is the presence of beneficial insects. So for example, if you had five aphids in your sweep net after 10 sweeps, and you had 10 Asian lady beetles that feed on those aphids, well, that's certainly not going to justify a threshold to treat if you've got plenty of predator or beneficial insects out in your field. Let's come back to the math because that's what this really entails. Let's say, for example, that I had 150,000 plants on a per acre basis, and I know I have to get above 10,000 bugs. Just do the simple math, that's one bug for 15 plants. So that's how some of these thresholds are arrived at. If the farmer goes out and counts two bugs per 15 plants, he knows that he's got enough of a problem out there, he can absolutely justify the treatment and basically double his money when he sprays. The other thing that farmers will look at when it comes to spraying for insects is that many of these insects, like a soybean aphid for example, will reproduce and they'll go through several generations per year. So by stopping them on the early side with that first generation, they avoid having to deal with them again and again and again throughout the season. Now with some insects, like let's talk about corn rootworm for example, they're in the larvae stage where they're a worm only for a few weeks out of the year. And so farmers, if they miss that window and they don't treat them as a larvae, well, that bug isn't gonna stay in that worm stage very long. Pretty soon it's out of the ground, it's an adult, and it's a whole different insect to deal with. Now we're looking at maybe some silk clipping or something like that. Basically a different economic roots. threshold. So that's what it comes down to. Different stage of insect, a different size of insect may have a different economic threshold. All we're trying to get at here is the farmer is trying to find numbers 
so he can simply run the math. That's, that's what it all amounts to. So if the farmer can get numbers saying, hey, this number of bugs causes this amount of yield damage, now I can run my own numbers for an economic threshold. So for example, if it costs $10 to treat, I need to have a lot more bugs than if it costs $3 or $4 to treat. And that's really all we're talking about here. If that crop is worth a lot of money and the cost for treatment is low, I can spray with few amount of bugs in the field. If my crop is worth very little, let's say it's a drought year, I can only get a few bushels anyway, it's not worth much money, and the cost of treatment is high, then I know that my economic threshold, I have to have a lot of bugs out there to justify the treatment. And the university system in our country has done such a nice job over the years of looking at what kind of impact certain insects have on our crops, and they've figured out how much yield loss will be caused by a certain number of insects out in the field. And then it's just up to us as farmers to run the economics on that because if the treatment option is two dollars versus the treatment option is twenty dollars per acre well that makes a big difference as to how many bugs it's going to take in your field to trigger that treatment well we may run similar economic numbers on our weed of the week we'll tell you how to control it on your farm coming up later in the show What's next in weed control technology? Roundup Ready 2 Extend Soybeans will provide tolerance to dicamba and glyphosate and will be built on the Genuity Roundup Ready to Yield trade. See them in action at extendfollowafield.com. I wish I could side dress more than just nitrogen. You can. While side dressing is efficient for nitrogen applications, you can also use that opportunity to apply PK and the micronutrients your crop needs. AgroLiquids Calibrate and MicroLink products allow you to nutritionally balance your side dress application efficiently and economically. Let Agriculture Liquid Fertilizer help you make your next crop a bumper crop. For more info, visit agroliquid.com. Wake up, breakfast is served. Your roots crave pee. Most of your applied pee gets tied up in the soil, a natural phenomenon known as phosphorus fixation. Fix the problem with a Veil Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer. A Veil makes more pea available to your roots. Here, here, and here. Increasing pea availability can lead to increased pea uptake in the plant. That's more pea, more pea, and more pea. More phosphorus for your crop can mean more results in your bin. An average of 9.6 bushels per acre of corn. Breakfast is served. Supercharge your pea with a Veil. You can put more bushels in your bin without expanding the farm with Yield Trap. The new 24 row planter from Titan Machinery features the Case IH Early Riser Planting System. Yield Trap will take you to the field first with extra flotation come spring. The tracks eliminate pinched rows and reduce compaction. All 22 and 30 inch Yield Tracks come loaded with Case IH technology, including cable drive and AccuRow. Grab more bushels from every acre with Yield Trap from Titan Machinery. Looking to maximize yield? QuickRoots is a microbial seed inoculant that allows the plant root to explore a greater volume of soil, the key to higher yields. QuickRoots continues to generate yield response on corn, soybeans, wheat, and more. QuickRoots is applied to the seeds so the live microorganisms go right to work, enhancing seedling vigor, increasing the uptake of certain nutrients, including NPK, and expanding root volume. Maximize yield on your farm this season. Call TJ Technologies or your local dealer and get your quick roots today. A proven herbicide for decades, dicamba can provide burn down residual control of tough and resistant weeds for up to 14 days. That's another reason why farmers will use dicamba for years to come. Brought to you by Roundup Ready Plus Weed Management Solutions. Over the last few years, we've seen a lot of Roundup resistant weeds developing across the United States. So today we want to talk a little bit about what you should throw with your Roundup in soybeans to best control weeds. Now let me start off by saying all the options, Darren, are pretty lousy. I don't like them. Hopefully you did put a good pre-emerge program down, but if you're going to go with something post, there at least are some choices. They're just probably not going to be perfect. Well, we're talking about killing Roundup resistant broadleaf weeds. That's really the key, and we're talking about doing it in a broadleaf crop like soybeans, especially when Roundup isn't working for us anymore. And especially since none of these products are new. They're all 20 years old or more. Well, it's... there are some new products. It's just they're tank mixes <laughs> of 
old products. <laughs> right, it's just, it's just new names on old products. So any weed you've got, post-emergent soybeans, I have nothing new for you. I've got all 20-year-old materials. But you know what? Some of those things, like I say, aren't bad. You can get 90, maybe 95% control of two to four inch tall weeds. All right, let's start by talking about this. When we talk about weed control in soybeans, we've got to have a great pre-emerge strategy. We come in with three different sites of action pre-emerge. We use a PPO, we use one of the yellows like Trefland, Sunland, or Prowl, and then we like to use Metribuzin. If we can use one of each of those classes of chemistry, we'll do a great job on a lot of these broadleaf weeds so we don't have so many to fight post-emerge. The other thing that I'll say is this, a lot of our post-emerge options like Pursuit, like Flexstar, I mean there's just first a number rate. of them, first rate, that can be used pre-emerge or post, save all those for post if you possibly can. Now, if you've already pulled the trigger and used some of them pre, we'll have to give you a couple options here post-emerge and I'll say this, like you were saying, the first option kind of stinks, the second option <laughs> really stinks worse. So we're going to have to probably burn your beans just a little bit trying to kill some of these weeds if you've already used up your best post-emerge option. Okay, so as we're going through these different products on, in other words, which is best for each particular weed, just understand, hey, if I've already used that product pre, chances are I can't use it again post. All right, let's rapid fire through some weeds. Well, let's just start off with the big one. Let's start off with Palmer pigweed or tall water hemp. If you have a pigweed yep, I like, species weed that's resistant to Roundup, what do you do? Yep, I like Flexstar the best. The issue with Flexstar is the use rate and where it can be used. It's not labeled in all areas of the United States. It's certainly not labeled to the west where they have little rainfall and lower rates are used the farther west and the farther north you go because carryover is a concern with Flexstar. But Flexstar is absolutely the best on any of those pigweed species. Number two, I would say, is either it's uh, cobra. cobra. It's Cobra. Cobra is well, number two. Cadet would be well, number yeah. three. Cobra, that, Cadet. That's really one, two, three. Yeah. Now, if you have Flexstar labeled in the area, great. If you don't, then I would turn to Cobra. Now, here's the other thing. For any of these products to work, and the same is going to be true on the other broadleaf weeds we're going to talk about for the most part. You have to kill them when they're small, otherwise it gets very difficult when they're big. And so have we're fairly talking, good coverage and use the right spray edge. We're talking two to four inch tall weeds, that's it, and it's going to take full rates of these products to make it work. So whatever the full rate is for your area, like Brian was talking about Flexstar, for your area, it's right. going to vary throughout the country. With Cobra, it's typically 12 and a half ounces. With Cadet, it could be as high as nine tenths of an ounce. You just have to check the label on the rotation that you've got and in your area. All right, next weed. All right, the next one would be common ragweed. Common ragweed, the best thing is first rate. I'd say Flexstar and Cobra would be number two. I don't know which I like better, but first rate's absolutely the best. If you used first rate pre though, don't use it post. You've got a lot more risk for carryover. Okay, how is that different from giant ragweed? Same. I do the same thing with giant ragweed as I would with common ragweed, but just understand giant ragweed's very recognizable when it gets three or four feet tall. We're talking about three or four inch tall weeds. If it's bigger than three or four inches, then there's nothing I can give you for an option that's going to be great. Plus the growth rate for giant ragweed is pretty fast, so you have to get out there early and you have to yep. get used to seeing these weeds when they're only a couple inches tall and only have a few leaves. That's when you need yep, to identify hey, them. Yep, the good news with both first rate and Flexstar, they do have some residual, so I'd way rather have you spray too early than too late. Okay, mare's tail. <laughs> mare's tail, uh, I think well, you first probably all, like first, first rate the best. I like the combination of classic and Flexstar the best. All right, but let's talk about burn down because a lot of people think, well, I have to have Roundup in there. It's my burn down. No, I no, don't. A lot of people think they have to have 2,4-D in there, and I don't like that either because 2,4-D right ahead of soybean planting, you're taking tremendous risk with your yield. So pre-emerge, I'd use something like Authority or Valor plus Metribuzin plus some fertilizer, and usually that's okay. Yeah, and you can use Gramoxone too and just yes, fry Gramoxone's things off good. above yep, ground. Yep. That would be a good, good option. All right, um, next weed. Okay, let's look right now. Kosha? Kosha, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say at a weed that isn't quite Roundup yeah. resistant, but well, Kosha is Roundup resistant. Yep. Kosha post-emerge is probably the one in soybeans we have the least amount of control on. I don't care what product you use. I'd say Cobra is best. I don't know what you think, but I like Cobra the best, and I would say you're talking 70 to at very best 90% control. Well, here's the problem. It's also ALS resistant almost right. everywhere, so the best options were the ALS products. Now, yeah, Cobra is probably number one. Okay, I was going to talk about Lamb's Quarter, yep. and well, it's not really Roundup resistant, but it is highly tolerant to Roundup. Yep, but the good news there is it's not ALS tolerant, and so what I would suggest is harass. That's basically the old pinnacle, the generic of the old pinnacle. All right, let's take another one that isn't really Roundup resistant, but if two quarts of Roundup only get, at best, 80% control, wild buckwheat is 
pretty much I don't much know. Resistant. I mean, if you kill wild buckwheat with Roundup and it's an inch tall, chances are you're going to get most of it. Well, good luck Better than 80%. It. I mean, we're talking about a viney yeah, weed here. And this is part of it. If you can Roundup get it before it the vines, vines out, yep, morning you glory, a Morning glory, wild buckwheat. Roundup is just a little weak on those particular weeds. So the best thing, in our opinion, is to use Pursuit. The problem is Pursuit with Pursuit. Or Raptor. Yeah, Pursuit or Raptor. I only usually recommend a half rate or maybe a three quarter rate because I'm worried about carryover. So it depends on the area of the country that you're in. The other interesting thing with Pursuit and Raptor, we talk about all these herbicides and oh, they carry over so much more in high pH. Well, guess what? Pursuit and Raptor carry over more in low pH ground. So make sure you're liming your soil. Now, the other thing, Velvet Leaf, this one isn't that hard to kill, but it is pretty prolific. I mean, even a small now, little that's Velvet the Leaf one, can have the seed That's the out. one where I would say we can get almost 100% control out of either resource or cadet. The problem is you're not going to have, you know, tremendous season long residual or anything. That's another reason why some guys like throwing some pursuit in there because that does give you some residual on velvet leaf. But otherwise, resource and cadet are great and they'll even kill great big velvet leaf. All right, well, we've rapid fired through a bunch of weeds there, but we haven't even talked about our weed of the week. We'll tell you how to stop that one coming up later in the show. I will take action against herbicide resistant weeds. I will know my weeds, and I will stop them before they go to seed. I will do whatever it takes to give my crops the upper hand, and I will use multiple herbicide sites of action because every action counts. I will take action, this time, for all time. Capello corn headers are designed for producers who expect more. Expect more grain in your bin. Expect an industry-leading two-year manufacturer's warranty. Expect Capella design chopping and folding options that save you time and money. And whether red, green, or yellow, expect row size options that fit your operation because all producers deserve the best. Expect Capello. It's a head above the rest. A farmer's attention to detail is what makes the difference. You take the time for service management because you know how vital it is to your operation. You service your field like everything else because soil sampling makes all the difference and gets the results you want. Download the app Soil Test Pro and start grid sampling today. Keep your farm growing strong. The more you test, the more you know. Get the most from the genetic potential in your crops, reduce plant stress, and increase yield. BioForge upregulates key genes to keep roots growing and reduce ethylene for improved plant stress tolerance. BioForge mixes well with other products for easy application with every pass through the field. BioForge, progressive grower's choice to improve root growth, reduce crop stress, and increase yield. Make every growing day count with BioForge from Stoller USA. If you watch Ag PhD TV, you'll love the new Ag PhD radio show each weekday on Rural Radio Sirius XM Channel 80. This is Darren Hefty. On the new Ag PhD radio program, we'll take live callers and provide the agronomic information and brotherly banter you've come to expect from Ag PhD. We'll feature a Back 40 segment where we talk to farmers and agronomists around the country to share what's going on with crop production. And it wouldn't be Ag PhD without addressing a pest of the day. Tune in to the Ag PhD radio show each weekday at 2 p.m. Central on Rural Radio Sirius XM Channel 80. Wouldn't it be nice if there was some way you could talk to your crop and it could just tell you, hey, Brian, I'm short on some potassium. Could you feed me a little bit more potassium? Wouldn't that be awesome? I hear those voices all the time as I walk through our fields, Brian, <laughs> because I'm looking at our plant tissue analysis results. And when you look at plant tissue analysis results, that's exactly what it's doing. I call it the report card for the farmer because it tells you exactly how good your fertility program is. Are you putting the right amounts of the right products out there at the right time for your plants? When you look at a plant tissue analysis, it's going to tell you, depending on the stage of growth, what nutrient level you are at and what your target level should be. So it'll rate them as you're excessive, you're high, you're sufficient, you're low, you're deficient out in the field on various nutrients, including nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but also secondary nutrients like sulfur and calcium and magnesium, and of course the micronutrients. And I think it's critical to get a complete analysis so your plant can tell you the whole story. Okay, but here's the thing. You'll talk to some agronomists out there and they'll say, well, that plant tissue testing, it's not very accurate or it's hard to use that or something like that. Well, here's the reason why they're wrong. If you 
look at just one day, one test, one time, one spot, they're right. I agree 100%. But if you do what we suggest, and that's go out every week for 10 to 12 weeks, starting right away with corn and any grass plant, or starting a little bit later in the season with any broadleaf crop like soybeans, you go out for that 10 to 12 weeks, once a week, first thing every morning, you pull plant tissue samples. I will guarantee you by the end of that 10 to 12 weeks, you'll have a pretty good idea what's going right and what's going wrong in your field, and you'll be able to tweak your fertility program going forward. Now, if you want to do some side dressing based on plant tissue results, or you want to do some foliar feeding, you certainly can. But what Darren and I use the data for more than anything is, like he says, it's the report card for how good a job did we do with our pre-emerge soil fertility program. And what we learned on our own farm here, let's step back about 15 years ago when we first started doing this plant tissue analysis. The reason why we did it is every year we get to the end of the year and we'd say, boy, we thought the corn was going to be better. What do we need to do? And we'd talk about it with our dad and everything. And we'd say, well, let's just put more nitrogen on. That'll probably do it. And we weren't getting anywhere. And so somebody suggested, hey, why don't you do this plant tissue test? So we started doing it and we realized every single test that was coming back, we were excessive on nitrogen and we were completely deficient on potassium, boron, and zinc. So the very next year, we didn't have to spend any more money on fertilizer. We just took some of our nitrogen dollars, put that into potassium, boron, and zinc. And what do you think magically happened to yield? Our yields went up, our costs stayed flat. So obviously we made a lot more money. That's fun. That's what we're looking for on the farm. And that's what plant tissue testing can help you do. So here's exactly what we want you to do. Continue to do a good job with soil testing or even do a better job with soil testing and especially learn how to read your soil test. That's super important. To supplement that, we want you to do some plant tissue analysis. So you don't have to do every field every year or anything like that. If nothing else, for this year, just get started with one field and mark the best area and the worst area in that one field and either use a flag or use GPS coordinates and go back to those same two spots every Monday morning for 10 to 12 consecutive weeks. When you pull plant tissue spots from those two areas, send them in separately, have them sampled separately. By the end of that 10 to 12 weeks, you're gonna have so much great information. It's really gonna help you change your fertility program for the better going forward. And most importantly, it's gonna help you best invest your fertilizer dollar in the right thing. Well, plant tissue analysis is very important. It can certainly help you change your fertility program on your farm to start accelerating the yield gains that you're getting with your crops. The other thing you can pull when you're out in the field pulling plant tissue analysis is you can pull our weed of the week. It might be a good way to get rid of this week's weed. Can you identify it? The Weed of the Week is sponsored by the Enlist Weed Control System from Dow AgroSciences, a new herbicide and trait system that will build on glyphosate. Your farm tells a story, one that continues with the decisions you make. Introducing the Enlist Weed Control System, an advanced herbicide and trait system that will build on glyphosate for exceptional control of tough weeds. The next chapter begins. Our weed of the week is hemp sesbanian. It has yellowish orange flowers, lots of leaves, and it really escapes a lot of the pre-emerge treatments that are out there. Our three pre-emerge soybean program works pretty well where we're using primarily Valor, that's been the best one controlling hemp sesbania, but also if you mix it with a yellow like a Treflan, Sonlan, or Prowl, and some Metribuzin. We can do a really nice job, 90% or better on hemp sesbania. Then post-emerge, Bassagran is probably the best one. I know you don't like to hear that, Brian, because uh, you prefer pursuit to raptor in a lot of cases on some of these weeds, but Bassergan is probably the best one to add with your Roundup. Then you could also use some Flex Star too. Okay, turning to corn, verdict we probably like the best pre-emerge, status post-emerge in wheat. I'd say absolutely you want some sharpen down. Follow that up with addition broad spec, maybe husky along with addition broad spec, but usually this isn't a major problem in wheat. We see it more in soybeans where actually hemp sesbania can host soybean cyst nematodes. It's a good reason to get it out of your fields. And it likes wetter soils too, so improve your drainage and chances are hemp sesbania won't be a big issue for you. That's all the time we have for this week's weed, but Iron Talk is coming up next. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. What are farmers doing to feed the planet? They're using Quadtrek technology, soil management, and planting systems from Case IH to foster a better growing environment that maximizes yield potential. Visit CaseIH.com to be ready.
With spring rains come mud, at least for a little while, and sometimes stuck equipment. We'll talk about why your neighbor always gets stuck and what you can do to avoid the same result on your farm in today's Iron Talk. Did you ever notice that the same people are always getting their sprayers stuck on the wet years? Sure, maybe they could have waited an extra day or two to go out in the field, but there really can be big differences from one machine to the next. Let me explain. Considering self-propelled sprayers, there are some big differences. Some have booms in the front of the machine, others have booms in the back. Some have the engine out front, others have it behind the cab. The size and positioning of the spray tank is also a big consideration. But when it comes to getting stuck in a mud hole, the term weight distribution is one that you should pay attention to on your farm. There's a big difference from one brand to the next. By shifting more weight to the rear axle as you travel through soft and wet soil, your rear end of the equipment is much more likely to sink and eventually get stuck. Sprayers that balance the weight equally from front to back and from side to side are much less likely to find the bottom of a mud hole. Before you take your sprayer to the field next time, run across a scale and look at where the weight is distributed. It may just change your perspective and it will definitely help you improve your performance. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now, back to the show. The math for getting higher yield potentials is simple. Four is greater than two. Steiger Road Track Series tractors give you proven Case IH Quattrek technology, helping you cover more acres in less time. And with four independent oscillating tracks, you'll also minimize ground pressure and compaction for a better growing environment all of which adds up to higher potential yields. The world of farming is changing. Be ready with Case IH. I will take action against herbicide-resistant weeds. I will know my weeds, and I will stop them before they go to seed. I will do whatever it takes to give my crops the upper hand and I will use multiple herbicide sites of action because every action counts. I will take action, this time, for all time. Could I boost my potential by foliar feeding? You can. Foliar feeding can correct nutrient deficiencies and sustain your crop through stress. It's a great way to deliver nutrients that your crop lacks to reach its full potential. Research proves it. Applied alone or in combination with your crop protection program, AgroLiquid products assure that when the season presents opportunity, you can boost your crop's yield potential by foliar feeding. For more info, visit agroliquid.com. If you could see how nitrogen loss causes yield loss, you'd fix it. So fix it right. With the stabilizer proven to reduce all three ways nitrogen escapes. Nutrisphere N Nitrogen Fertilizer Manager. It keeps nitrogen in a more readily available form longer. With today's market and environment, it's a high priority to keep your nitrogen on track. To higher yield with Nutrisphere N. Closed captioning for Ag PhD is sponsored by Norwood Sales. The all-new s -Cube commercial tender is the only tender on the market with poly tanks, giving you the capability to haul seed, fertilizer, water, or liquid fertilizer. Each cube can hold 300 units of seed, 2,000 gallons of liquid, or 300 cubic feet of fertilizer. Options include full-functioning wireless remote, stainless steel conveyors, and self-contained hydraulics. Get yours today at Norwood Sales. That's all the time we have for today's show, but be sure to tune in to Sirius XM Channel 80 each weekday for the live Ag PhD radio show at 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern. And be sure to tune in again next time to Ag PhD TV for another Weed of the Week Farm Basics Iron Talk and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. Subsurface drainage tile is used around your home and in farmers' fields to remove excess water safely. As water filters down through several feet of soil, it is purified naturally. To learn more about clean water leaving farm fields, visit the Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation at rnmf.org.